Let's read Psalm 126 together. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord. As streams renew the desert, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Do you love tear jerkers? I mean, movies that um, make you sad, make you cry. It's a very popular genre. And here's what the people say that love that genre. I love to be moved. That's one of the things. The other thing is I feel solidarity. I feel I'm not alone. There's a lot of other people that share the same type of sadness that I have. Some people say, when I cry about the dog that died in the movie, it's not just about that dog, it's about my dog that died. It helps me to get in touch with my own sorrow and pain. And I just feel better after that. Now, we all had to deal with a lot of losses in the past few years. A loss of normality, of freedom, of celebration, of touch, of people, of relationships, of money. We can go on. And some people don't even know what their losses are. I spoke to somebody that said, there's a vague feeling that I've missed out and I'm not sure on what I've missed out. What do you do? Where do you go if you experience losses? Do you go to sadness? And what do you do with sadness? Now, the Indians of the Americas have a saying, crazy time. When you have to deal with a big loss, like, for instance, somebody that you dearly loved, you enter crazy time things are not going to be what they used to be. And you know that. You've lost the joy of your life. You've lost the thing that gave you meaning in life. And you are in a space now where you wonder what it's going to be like. You know, if you feel that it's unfair, you might even sit with anger as well. And if you're very uncertain about the future and you wonder whether you're going to make it, there's also some fear in that mixture and cluster of feelings that we can describe as grief that you sit with. Sociologists describe this space as liminal space. It's an important place to be, but it's very important what you're going to do while you are there. It's a time to reorient your life, to find new meaning or the meaning that you had in life. You've got to find your way back to yourself and to others and to life again. And that way is very unique to each one of us, like our fingerprints. But there are some things that we share in this journey. And Psalm 126 is a reorientation psalm that invites us to do something with our sadness. Three things. I'm invited to accept my sadness. Look at this. Yes, the Lord has done an amazing thing for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord. What happened here? We are glad. And, and, it, and it sounds as if they... We're in exile, which must have been uh, the most terrible experience that you can go through. Losing everything that you have. Um, families are broken up. But now, we're getting back what we've lost. 
We're returning to Jerusalem. We are reunited with our loved ones. This joy, but suddenly something happened. We don't know what. And there's no reason why things change. It's just the way life is. It's the nature of life. Suddenly, we are all in sadness. We are challenged. We sit with grief. Please help us again, Lord. I love the Sanskrit word, tatata, the suchness of life. And that's perhaps one of the first words that we learn as little babies, tata, tata, to say goodbye this way, you know? Uh, that's life. The in, impermanence of life. Life is dynamic. It's not something static. It's changing all the time. Um, the, you know, the fleetiness of life. Jesus said, our lives are like a mist. You know, when the sun comes up, easily, quickly, it evaporates and it's gone. His brother James said, it's like grass. Watch the grass. It's there only for a season. Suddenly, there's no more grass. His beloved disciple John said, Everything in this life will pass. It means that the good news, that your sorrow will pass. You know, and, and that is perhaps a few very dynamic, powerful, therapeutic words that you can tell yourself and say to your soul, this too shall pass. If you in a place of exile, but Jerusalem, the joy that we have, will also pass. And, and that's where the problem comes in. It's, it's as if we have this idea of life that we climb the mountain, we get to the top, like James and John with Jesus, that we would say, this is the ultimate life. Let's stay here. Let's keep this. But it's not possible. And perhaps we all have that dream deep inside of us. It's the dream for heaven, actually. And we think we can have it here. This too shall pass. Newton tells a story of reading the newspaper. And his wife comes in. And she says, there's a spider on your neck. And he said, yes. And he keeps on reading. And she said, Did you hear me? What did I say? And of course, men has this incredible, wonderful gift that we can always pick up those last few words. And he said, you said, there's a spider on my neck. And he said, what? There's a spider on my neck. And he jumped up. You see, suddenly, an idea, you know, a fact moved to another place in his life. He realized, he accepted the reality of the fact that there's a spider on his neck and now it makes a difference in his life and in his behavior. To accept the impermanence of life is not a rational cognitive process. You have to get deep insight And feel it and know it. It will help you not to hold on too strong to bad things, but also not too strong on to good things that happen to you in life. And it will help you not to point a finger at yourself if something goes wrong. Because what's the first thing we sometimes say? What's wrong with me? Did I sin? Did I do something wrong? Why does this happen to me? It is tatata. It's not somebody else's fault. Why did they do it? If that, did, they didn't do that. If this didn't happen, this wouldn't have happened. It's this, there doesn't have to be a reason. It's just the suchness of life. Accept it. The next invitation is to feel your sadness. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Jesus said. Um, now, now, this is the 
process, the way of sorrow, of sadness. It comes over you. It's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's a mood. Suddenly, it comes over you. You have no control. When, where, how, and sometimes why. It just comes over you. And in that regard, it's a lot like love, like falling in love. You've got no control. But then, a very important next phase. Allow the feelings by thinking about it and feeling it. Allow it. You can resist it. You can say, no, I'm not going to accept it. And I wonder whether our culture doesn't encourage us to do that. When I visited my first experiences of sadness this week, um, I realized one of the first experiences was a, a funeral we had. Me and my brother for our cat that died. So we buried the cat and we sing, um, Asai weer kom, asai weer. When he returned, when he returned, he will come for his jewels. We sang that together. And as we sang it, my brother started weeping, sobbing. And a tear flowed on, th on my cheek. And I wasn't sure if I think back whether I cried about the cat or my brother or both of them, but I immediately resisted it. And I went to him and I said, everything is going to be all right. Let's stand up. Let's go and play. It's over now. I couldn't allow him and I, I resisted it. Nobody taught me to do that. I don't know where I got it, but that was one of my first experiences. Culturally, cowboys don't cry. Huh? And then theologically, don't feel sad. You know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Be happy. If something bad happens to you, just confess good things. You know, quote the scripture. Be triumphant. That's faith. And God will turn around everything. Now, the message of the Psalms and the life of Jesus invites us to something else. No. The man of sorrows said, weep, accept it. There's a, a saying in therapeutic circles, everything that you resist will persist. You'll store it up inside of you and it will have an effect on you. Allow it and then weep. That is something physical that you do. That's your body's reaction to this emotion of sadness in you. And that's the way God made us and wired us. And a lot of us say, but I can't weep. Find your way, ask God. I was one of those and I was invited by somebody that talked to me and said, but why don't you ask God for the grace of tears? And I wondered, thinking back about that experience with my brother, whether he didn't help me to open up that pathway that I needed to get in touch with the sorrow and let it go through my body. You know, in the Old Testament times, they had people that um, they invited to weep at, at funerals. And even today in our culture, there's some people that, cultures and groups that invite people that professionally do it. Why? And it sounds so strange to some of us. Well, physiologically, it can help you to get in touch, to open up. To, they can give you the key to unlock that door between the emotion and the body so that it can go through your body. That's one of the ways. Tell your story. That's the next thing. Now, one of the most prolific researchers on grief says that uh, we thought of grief as, a, as, as phases, you know. But all the research today shows that it's not true, that it's very unique. But he found there's one thing we all have in common. Everybody, we all need a witness to our sorrow and pain. We need a witness. And by that way, we are letting it go through us. And if um, and, and you don't do it once, it, would, it will return suddenly, unexpectedly. To, 
the sorrow would return. But if the period start getting longer, prolonged, you know, and, and, and when the intensity of that experience subsides a bit, it's a good sign that you're busy grieving in a good way and you are releasing it. Jung said, neurosis is always a substitute for legitimate suffering. If we don't want to do this, it will make us sick. It will make us sick. From a neurological perspective, there's a difference between a limbic reaction and cognitive regulation. A limbic reaction is to keep the emotions in the area of your brain, you know, where, where, you, ex where you experience emotions, but you store it up. It just stays there. That part of the brain is also called the mammalian. It's the part of the brain that we share with mammals. They can also feel. But to take it, to let it through, to think about it, is to start with a regulation process. You can't control your emotions, um, but you can regulate by thinking about it. That happens in the front part of your brain, the new cortex, or, or, or also called the paleomammalian. It's the part that mammals don't have. But that's also the part of the brain where we can repress, where we can say and decide, no, I don't want to think about it. And by doing that, you keep it in the limbic area, in the mammalian. You store it up and it can make you sick. To be able to do this, you've got to have trust. You've got to be very courageous, you know, that the truth actually is that cowboys can cry. Um, you've really got to have a lot of courage to do this. I knew men, strong men, uh, ruthless in many ways, but too scared to go to this place. I can only do that if I know I won't die. I won't get stuck there. It's good for me. And that's one of the big messages of this psalm, that God can change a desert into a wonderful valley full of flowers. And the Hebrew word is Baka, um, which was actually a physical place in old Israel. You know, you, you get it in the word sometimes in the Bibles, in 84 verse 7, you'll get the word Baka. It's the valley of tears. God will change it in Baraka, the valley of joy. That's what Jesus did. This is Jesus' way. He lost his freedom, he lost his reputation, and he, he, he experienced a lot of stress and anguish. He shared it with his disciples and said that I'm, uh, um, it feels as if I'm going to die. And he was going to die. He was going to lose his life. And it was, he was fearful. But something happened. God raised him, gave him new life. And this is something, and it's called the Pascal Mystery, that we can see and we can experience, invited to participate in. The last thing is to verbalize my sadness. They weep as they go plant their seed. And we're invited to give words to our pain. That's what the psalmist did when he wrote the psalm. And you're invited to write a psalm. Perhaps your psalm is just a sentence. Um, it doesn't have to be a poem or rhyme or anything. It's just putting it, objectifying it, putting it outside of yourself, looking at it. It's very therapeutic. But to be able to do that, you need two big things. Time. You've got to make time for it. Now, again, Jung said, Harry is not of the devil. Harry is the devil. It's the cause of so much of our problems today. We don't have time for you. We just can't. You've got to make it very important to you. Your, look after your heart. Care after your heart. Because that's where your life comes from. And I can care by it by honoring it. I give it time. I think about it. I give words to it. And then I share it with other people. 
not everybody, any time, to some people. You've got to get a safe space. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the church could be a place like that? If you can get a small group where you can share safe, where they won't pathologize you, where they don't get fed up and feel that you should have been through it now, or where they don't get uncomfortable with your pain and suddenly help to save you like I like to try, like I try to save my little brother. No, 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 don't cry. People say, oh, he's at a better place now. No, somebody once said it to a lady and the lady turned right and she, she shouted. She got angry and she said, I don't care if he's at a better place. He's not at home. I need him at home. That's my pain. Where we can just listen, hold each other, have respect for each other's experiences. What a wonderful experience. What, what a wonderful world would it be if we can have safe spaces. But we have to share this with God as well. The Psalms was also prayers to God that were written. I went through a prayer journey but I spent about nine months um, <clears throat> with somebody else, pray an hour a day at once a week, meet with this prayer guide, and we uh, just share my experiences of my life and prayer and how I bring this all together. And he asked me a question every week. After sharing my life with him, he'd ask me, did you share this with him? And I said, of course. I've prayed about it. I've said, God, I'm not feeling good. Please come help me do this, do this. I've asked him things. And he kept on asking me, but did you share it with him? Did you share it with him the way that you shared it with me? And one day the penny dropped and I realized, but I don't do that. I don't share. I don't just talk with him and share exactly everything because he knows but if I'm a little child and my father knows exactly, I still share everything. And he, don't, he doesn't interrupt me. He listens to me. And he asks me. And by sharing with him, I give him access to my life. He comes into my heart and something sticks and stays there. I feel better. I'm feeling courage. And that's what we're invited to do. And it can lead and it will lead like the Psalms, which is actually one book, 150 Psalms, ends with praise and with joy. And Foyodor Dostoevsky, a famous Russian writer said, it's the great mystery of human life that old grief passes gradually into quiet, tender joy. What a wonderful thing to see seen it so many times in my life. Trauma. I don't know how that person is ever going to be on, on their feet again. How can they ever be happy and find life again? And they do. They do. It's wonderful. I don't know where you are today. Perhaps you're in a place of total disorientation. You experience acute, acute Grief and sadness, it'd be best to get in contact with a grief counselor. And we have some of them. You can contact the wholeness center. And as soon as possible, just start sharing it. Have the courage to acknowledge it and to reach out for somebody else. Perhaps you're at a place for reorientation, I use it with complicated sadness, you can still share. And we've got small groups, people coming together every week, and you're welcome to join one of them, where they just write a, a sentence, a little psalm about their life journey and about their sadness and share it with each other and experience what can happen to you. Perhaps you sit at the place where I'm in orientation. Really, I've, I've no sadness. Your sadness and losses of the past have been integrated into you. And they, they find their little place in your heart where they live now. And it's okay with you. You found a new life. Please share it with other people. Be generous. Especially if you get in a place where people sit with grief. Share your story with other people.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can be on this journey with you in life. Thank you for this invitation, for the path. If things happen to us, to go to you, to go on this journey, and to work with you, and help us to, to allow, help us to feel, help us to tell, to give words, Help us to experience how the Holy Spirit comforts us. If we work with you, if we sow the seeds of our tears and don't waste our tears, help us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you. Amen.